Hello, everybody. I'm Peter Voyevnik, uh, Vice President of Growth at Dicentra, and I'm here with William Morkel. Morkel, would you like to uh, introduce yourself quickly? Hi, I'm William Morkel, uh, Director of Quality and Compliance with Dicentra. Um, probably many of you have already met me uh, either remotely or virtually or in person, and um, but I welcome the opportunity to um, address you again. Thanks, William. And before we start here, I just want to acknowledge the time that you've been with Dicentra. And I did share this on LinkedIn the other day. Uh, but here's here's a picture of our group. I think I think this is actually from 2005. I posted on LinkedIn it was 2004, but you joined us in 2004 in November. So if you join us in November, this must be the next summer. Yeah, this would have been about the next summer. This was just Peter when we were getting ready to leave this office. Um, the office was just too small for us because we were growing so so quickly. So uh, this was kind of our farewell picture to that office, and we moved into a, a bigger office, a um, little north of um, north of where we were. You don't you don't look much different, but I I look very different. <laughs> um, well, thanks thanks for joining me today, William. And uh, it, it's nice for me to be able to connect with you and spend some time with you uh, since we've been operating virtually for quite some time. Um, but I want to talk to you today about site licensing. And, and to start, maybe you can give just a very quick top level overview of, of what a site license is, and then I can get into uh, asking questions why I'm bringing up site licensing. All right, so a site license is uh, something that every domestic manufacturer, packager, labeler, um, and or importer uh, needs in order to conduct their operations with respect to natural health products. So if you're manufacturing natural health products in Canada, you need that site license before you start those operations. Uh, if you're an importer, you need that site license before you import the product um, uh, into Canada. Um, I emphasize before. And uh, really what it does is site license speaks to your compliance to the natural health product GMPs. So you will um, prepare and submit a site license application. Health Canada will assess it, specifically an NHPD. And if they determine that, yes, this indicates compliance, that you are in compliance with the natural health product GMPs, they will issue you that site license. One other important point, if I can just say, say this, Peter, because there's some confusion about this out there, foreign sites, and manufacturers cannot get a site license. Um, what they do need to be, however, is annexed to the site license of an importer. So when the importer files for their site license, they're gonna not only demonstrate and provide documentations to show they're complying with the Canadian GMPs, but they also have to show that their foreign manufacturers uh, are complying with the Canadian GMPs or their equivalent. Okay. Uh, great, William. And and <clears throat> so the reason why I brought us together today um, is because I've been hearing a lot about site licensing, and it sounds like there's some really important movement around that right now. And I thought it'd be perfect to connect with you, and you could give us an overview of what exactly is happening. Yeah. So if you've heard about a lot happening with site licensing, um, unfortunately, probably it's been in a bad way. Um, <laughs> You know, the, the, the site licensing and GMP guidance documents haven't been updated for almost eight years now. Um, so there's really been no change in the expectations, which is a little surprising, you know, that there should be that kind of continuing improvement. But at least on Health Canada's side, there's not been any real updates or, or clarifications, new versions in that respect. Um, what we are seeing, however, and I say this kind of in, in kind of not on the positive side, is first of all, on the site licensing application side, about one third of site license applications are being refused. Um, so that's right at the door. That That's quite a significant um, uh, refusal rate. Um, then there's the other side of it, and this is the on-site audits. So about um, four or five years ago, the NHPD began a pilot 
project where they actually went out and did on-site audits. I said before, Peter, that to get a site license, you need to file your application. What that is, it's a paper-based review. You submit your paperwork, your records, and of course, people are going to put their best foot forward <laughs> when they submit their documents. Um, and so Health Canada said, well, just how good is that? What's actually going on out there? So 2017, um, 2018, they did their first round of audits. Um, the following year, approximately, they did the second round, and now they just completed the third round of audits. Um, they started March of last year, and they just wrapped it up March of this year. Um, for this latest round, a full one third of those companies audited received intent to suspend their licenses. Um, wow. That's not much better than the previous rounds where about 50% received um, notices of intent to either suspend their site licenses and or their product licenses as a consequence of these auditors going in and noticing um, and noting uh, non-compliance issues and deficiencies related to the GMPs that were, in the auditor's opinion, serious enough for them to issue those uh, intent to, to, suspend, to suspend. Now, um, just to give you a little scope, they they, um, they audited this last round about 30, 36 sites. Half of them were manufacturers, half of them were, were importers. So that's, you know, I would consider that a pretty good sample size. Um, and I suspect it's probably a pretty good indication of what's going on in industry as a whole. So that is certainly um, something to be concerned about in terms of, of the current status of where things stand. So in 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 light of this uh, data that Health Canada has collected, what what are they leaning towards at this point? Are they saying, OK, we need to go out and do more audits? Are they sort of turning to industry and saying, hey, you got to step up your game? Yeah, so Peter, you, you froze there, um, but I, I did get the, the I did I did get the gist of your, your question. Um, yes, so as a next step and then this is super, super important. The NH, uh, NHPD and Health Canada now want to make this a permanent inspection program. And this is what they're they're looking uh, towards. Um, I suspect that's what they intended all along. I think COVID may have delayed that a little bit, um, but that is what we are going to see see coming um, coming along. And um, next steps, they they want to still analyze the, la the latest results of the, the audits, the round of audits that they did. They also want to gauge um, industry and get stakeholder feedback as to what you know that audit program is going to look like, et cetera. So there's going to be some time for feedback, but certainly this is something that they're pushing, uh, going to be pushing, um, I suspect, fairly aggressively on, on implementing. Captain, and it, love with that, if I can just say, Peter, because this is uh, uh, another important element of this, and that is cost recovery. In order to fund this whole program, they are going to implement cost recovery. And that's not only going to apply to um, site licensing. So whenever you apply for your site license, whenever you renew your site license, it's going to apply to product licensing as well. Whenever you um, apply for product license uh, application and presumably they're going to follow the drug model um, where you're going to on an annual basis have to kind of pay that um, that annual fee to them to kind of continue marketing and selling your your NHPs. Okay great Ed, Ed, so you did answer my question there about the cost recovery what about uh, foreign sites? What's going to happen there is are they going to extend this audit program to foreign sites as well no there's there's no word on on that that that's not their intent at this at this stage um i don't think they have the resources um to do that also i don't think they want to bite off more than they can chew at this point so so, so this it, it's going to be looking They'll be looking more to the importer, I guess, and looking at sort of what sort of due diligence they've done evaluating their suppliers from that's outside exactly, of Canada. That's exactly what's going to happen. Yep. 
that this also happens um, tends to happen with um, lower risk OTC drugs, um, where in principle, yes, they can go out and audit the foreign sites, um, but oftentimes they'll just tend to rely on um, like an FDA uh, inspection report if the company's in the US, which is what they do for NHPs as well, um, or a third party audit. Um, I remember Dicentra one time did that for an OTC. Um, we went, we did the third party audit. Um, this was for a drug product and we submitted the report and our credentials to Health Canada for a domestic importer who was renewing their establishment license. And Health Canada didn't go out and audit the foreign site, but they did um, accept our report for that foreign site. So I suspect that's going to uh, be the same case. Maybe on a risk basis, they might decide to send somebody out, but it's not going to be uh, uh, incorporated as part of the regular auditing uh, as far as foreign sites are concerned. Now, I, I, I would say through all the years that I've known this industry, you know, I would say that uh, great care is taken in the majority of cases and making sure that you know these businesses are running uh, top-notch operations. So I, I guarantee you one third of these companies that have received this notice of intent of suspending their license are, are probably surprised. So what I want to ask you is what what would you recommend for site license holders to do right now in the short term uh, over the course of the, you know, the next six to 12 months, let's say, uh, to avoid being surprised and being one of those sites that receives this notice of intent of suspension? Yeah, so definitely review your um, current GMP quality system. Um, one of the requirements of an um, of, of the GMPs is that you are required to do self inspections and these should be done on an annual basis. Um, I suggest you might want to start there. Do an honest self inspection of yourself. Um, and if you don't have that kind of expertise, then certainly bring in a, a third party that has that expertise like Dicentra. We'd be more than happy to help you there. And um, do just, you know, do that self audit um, to see where you stand. And then that will give you the chance to identify your gaps and then start identifying the gaps starting with the most highest priority ones what are considered the higher risk risk ones yeah that there's um that there's time but i mean you you i mean first of all you don't want to wait for this to be launched and then you know you get your notice of audit you're, you're not gonna have time two weeks is not sufficient time to to get your system in, in order if you're not if you haven't been comp complying up up to that point um but just it's a legal requirement. So this is something that that should be done. Um, I agree with you, Peter. I think they were surprised. I think um, in I mean, you always get those bad apples out there who know that they're doing something wrong and they're just kind of thinking I'm getting away with this. Uh, then you get those who and this I see more often than not think they're in compliance. Um, and then boom, you're, you're, it, it turns out that they're not. So um, part of that is um, them not they, they them not having the internal experts um, to be able to actually recognize what the GMPs require. Um, another element of it is that I do put part of the blame on the, uh, Health Canada. Um, like I said, it's been a while since they've updated their their um, guidance documents, and when industry is getting a failure rate that high, you know. Health Canada should be kind of looking at what's the root cause of that. Uh, is it that they're not fully understanding the requirements? Um, what's going on there? And at least on Health Canada's side, is it that, that the guidance documents aren't clear enough? Um, what can they do on their side? And then kind of marry that to what industry should be doing. So to go back and answer your question, Peter, because I, I went a little bit on a tangent there, uh, what they should be doing now, I suggest looking at their quality systems um, to decide where they're falling short and then beginning to addri uh, start addressing those those issues and implementing a proper qu uh, compliant quality system. Uh, once you identify the gaps, then you have to decide, do we now have the in-house expertise to um, address those gaps and fill those gaps? Um, if we do have the expertise, do we have the 
capacity. Um, uh, you know, maybe our QA person has the expertise, but this is going to be quite a workload for them. And again, then you might want to consider looking to get some outside help and um, from a qualified third party. And certainly Dice Center would be more than happy to help in that area. That's fantastic. It reminds me of what happened um, in the United States. If, if, if I remember correctly, it's probably 10 years ago, the FDA started rolling out more audits <clears throat> of dietary supplement uh, you know, manufacturers, packages, labelers, and distributors. And uh, in the end, I think it was a good thing because it sort of weaned out the cheaters from the uh, legitimate companies who were there to uh, do everything in their power to, you know, um, make products that are, are very high quality and, and safe and effective. It did. It either weaned them out or it caused them to come into compliance. Um, Peter, just a little, little anecdote on that. Um, I remember when the NHP GMPs were launched before the dietary supplement GMPs in the States. And so we were going to these manufacturers in the States and saying, look, we need this from you and this from you and, and this from you to demonstrate compliance with the Canadian GMP so that we can annex you to those those importer site license like we discussed at the, at the opening of this uh, discussion. And um, so many of them are saying, this is ridiculous, this is ridiculous. No one could ever expect, we, we can't do these tests and, and it's not possible for us to implement this. And it's absolutely uh, ridiculous, this can't be done. Um, a few years later, then the dietary supplement GMPs kicked in for the states and um, that were mandatory. And it's amazing what those companies discovered they could do. And uh, it, um, it, it was good timing then because it brought kind of the two, um, the two sides on par and they were kind of speaking the same language and complying with um, reasonably similar GMP standards. That's right. Well, all right. Well, well there you have it. So we have uh, an inspection program that's likely going to be rolled out and it's going to be happening on a uh, on a consistent and maybe even permanent basis. And um, it's time to uh, to get ready for that. Right, William? And is anything else to add yeah. at this point? No, I, I I agree, Peter, and and even um, even apart from it it being um, the, these on-site audits. Remember what I said at the beginning: one third of site license applications are failing, um, are being refused. So even if this on-site audit issue that we're discussing, this permanent program was pushed a few years down the road, which I don't think it will be, but even if it were. Um, do you really want to be in a situation where you file a renewal and it gets refused, and now suddenly you've got to stop, um, you know, everything you're doing, your activities, your sales, everything, because uh, you can't manufacture, you can't import anymore. Um, so, so yeah, if uh, that vigilance is coming and that enforcement, uh, increased enforcement is coming, but either way, you want to be compliant with these GMPs. Okay, well, thanks so much, William. Always uh, a pleasure and an honor, really, to connect with you and, and tap into your wealth of knowledge and expertise. So thanks for sharing all that today. Well, thank you, Peter, for your time. Thanks. Take care.